Joyce Meyer Ministries dankt haar donateurs die deze uitzending mogelijk maakten. And I can tell you honestly, and I believe this with all my heart, your problem is really not your problem. Well, I guess we're going to have to stick on that one for a minute, aren't we? Because I tried to give you a spoonful of vegetables and you wouldn't swallow it. Well, today I'm going to teach on attitudes. I thought maybe a few people might need an attitude adjustment. Matter of fact, Dave said, what are you going to teach on today? And I said, something specifically for you, <laughs> attitudes. You know, um, I have one mirror in my house, like a decorative mirror that has a tendency to just get a little tiny bit crooked. And I don't, that kind of stuff bothers me. And so it's a little bit hard to get to it and adjust it. So sometimes I'll let it go for a while. And every time I walk by it, it just kind of like bothers me. And you know, that's the way a bad attitude is. It's like, you may let it go and let it go and let it go, but really it just kind of bothers you. You may not really know why your joy is messed up or why you don't feel as peaceful, but it not only bothers you, but it bothers everybody else if you have a bad attitude. But if I take just a little bit of effort, sometimes I got to stretch myself over another piece of furniture and get up there to that mirror. And if I just go, just a little tiny adjustment, then it just feels so good again when I'm in that room. Same way I've got a heat and an air conditioning vent in my office at home that every once in a while, the little vents in it will get in a certain position where it will make this weird little noise when the air blows through it. And I don't do well with weird little noises. <laughs> I'd almost rather have a loud noise than a weird little nitpicky noise. And so sometimes I'll put up with it for a couple days and then I'll have to get somebody to come and make a little adjustment and then it's okay again. You might be surprised how much better your life would be if you would just make a little adjustment in your attitude. And I find out that there's so many wrong attitudes that we can get into and so many right ones that we need to have that we need to adjust our attitude on a daily basis. You know, it's pretty easy, for example, to get discontented, isn't it? A little bit grumpy, a little murmury, just not really too satisfied with what you got. Think you ought to have more. Well, let me help you adjust your attitude. If you feel a little grumpy, maybe you're having a little hard time sleeping tonight, just remember the homeless family who has no bed to lie in. Should you find yourself stuck in traffic, don't despair. There are people in the world for whom driving an automobile is an unheard of privilege. Should you have a bad day at work, think of the man who's been out of work for three months. Should you despair over a relationship that is troublesome, think of the person who's never even known what it's like to love or to be loved. Should you grieve over the fact that your boss denied your request to work four days a week and have a three-day weekend, think of the woman in dire straits working 12 hours a day, seven days a week for $10 a week just to feed her family in a third world country. Should your car break down leaving you a mile away from assistance, Think of the paraplegic who would love the opportunity to take that walk. If you didn't get the parking place that you wanted when you came to the conference today and you had to walk a couple of blocks and you complained, it's time for an attitude adjustment. Should you notice a new gray hair in the mirror? Think of the cancer patient in chemotherapy who wishes she even had some hair to examine. Should you find yourself discouraged because you can't decide what your life's calling is? Be thankful. There are those who didn't even live long enough to get the opportunity to think about what their life's calling might be. Should you find yourself the victim of other people's bitterness, ignorance, smallness, or insecurities? Remember, things could be worse. You could be that person. There's all kinds of attitudes, positive attitudes, negative attitudes. Contented, discontented, humble, proud, haughty, responsible, irresponsible, thankful, unthankful, merciful, unforgiving, self-pitying. The list just goes on and on and on and on and on. 
But if you can keep your attitude the way that Jesus kept his attitude, and he should be our example in everything, including attitude, Philippians 2 says, let this same attitude and humble mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus. Let him be your example in humility and every other kind of attitude. I'm telling you today that if you can adjust your attitude on a daily basis, no matter what's going on in your life, you can still enjoy your life. Let me ask you a question. Is your problem really your problem or is it your attitude toward your problem that's your problem? <laughs> One more time. Is your attitude really your problem? I mean, is your problem really your problem or is it your attitude toward your problem that's the problem? Do you know that there are people in the world who have the exact same problem that you do and yet they're a lot happier than you are and there's people who have a much worse problem than you and yet they're a lot happier than you are? And it's not about the problem, it's about the way they decide to look at their problem. You know, this message today is not hard. There's nothing deep about it. There's nothing complicated about it. But if you can get hold of this today, I believe many of you that have been unhappy and lack peace and not making any progress in your life, if you can just keep your attitude lined up with God's will, you'd be amazed at what will happen in your life. Change your outlook, you can change your life. Your attitude is your thought life turned inside out. It's the way you decide to think about things. Your attitude affects everything. It affects you. It affects the people around you. It especially affects your countenance, the look on your face. It doesn't take very long to find somebody who has a bad attitude. An airplane has an instrument on it called the attitude indicator. Now you would think it would be the altitude indicator, but it's called the attitude indicator. And it shows the position of the plane to the horizon. When the airplane is climbing, it's said to have a nose-high attitude because the nose of the airplane is pointed above the horizon. When the aircraft is diving, it's said to have a nose-down attitude because the nose of the plane is below the horizon. Now, assuming that the horizon represents average, if we have a nose-high attitude, our life is going to be above average. If we have a nose-down attitude, then our life is going to be below average. What kind of life do you want to have? Well, Joyce, I just want God to bless me and give me a good life. Well, are you willing every day to renew your mind and renew your attitude? Take a little bit of time every morning in your time with God on your way to work and just think, is there any area in my life, God, where I need an attitude adjustment? When people ask you later today where you were today, you could say, I was busy getting an attitude adjustment. And boy, did I ever need it. Probably some of you, a lot of mornings when you turn my TV program on, when it's over, you've had an attitude adjustment. Anybody's attitude can be changed if they want to change it. Ephesians 4.23. And be constantly renewed, and be constantly renewed in the spirit of your mind, constantly having a fresh mental and spiritual attitude. Now let's back up and look at verse 22. Strip yourselves of your former nature, put off and discard your old unrenewed self, which characterized your previous manner of life and becomes corrupt through lust, desires that spring from delusion. He's saying, put off the old man, put off the old life. Don't act the way that you used to act anymore. Now jump over to verse 24. And put on the new nature, the regenerate self, created in God's image, God-like in true righteousness and holiness. So verse 22 says, stop acting like the old man. Verse 24 says, and begin to act like the new creature that you are, but verse 23 is the bridge from how we get 
from acting like the old man to acting like the new man. Let's put verse 23 up again. And be constantly renewed in the spirit of your mind, having a fresh mental and spiritual attitude. You know, it's your attitude in life, not your aptitude, that will determine your level of success. You don't need to worry so much about whether you're as gifted as somebody else. You might not be as gifted as somebody else at work, and the devil would like to make you think, well, you didn't get a chance to go to college, so you'll never get a promotion, or, you know, you're not as smart as them, you'll never get a promotion, but I'll tell you a secret. If you will have a better attitude than anybody else in the company, you'll get promoted above everybody else. I would much rather work with somebody who's got a great attitude and maybe is not the sharpest tool in the box as somebody who just really has got it all together and man, they can just run circles around everybody and do 25 different things, but man, they have got a stinking, prideful, haughty, I'm better than everybody else attitude. You'll be amazed how the Holy Ghost will hook up with you if you'll just keep a good attitude. I want to work with people who have a humble attitude, a thankful attitude, a positive attitude, a responsible attitude. Take an attitude inventory. If you would describe your general attitude toward life, which one of the following songs would you be singing when you get up every morning? Make the world go away. Raindrops keep falling on my head. I'll do it my way. <laughs> or, oh, what a beautiful morning. Oh, what a beautiful day. <laughs> now, I have to tell you that in the earlier years of mine and Dave's marriage, before God really got a chance to do much work on me, I was one serious, somber, bad attitude. Lady. Dave, on the other hand, is happy and positive and just, he, you know, he likes, he gets up and he'd start singing, and I would actually ask him to be quiet. <laughs> Do you have to sing when you get out of bed in the morning? I wanted to think about my problems and what everybody had done to me, what I was going to do to get them back. And it sounds funny, but the sad thing is, is it's actually true. I didn't want to hear it. Well, you know what? I think the Lord's tired of hearing some of you sing the same old song. And in Psalm, it says in several places, sing unto the Lord a new song. And so I wrote a new song for you. See if you can learn to sing this song. No matter what comes my way, I'm going to have a good day. Everything will be okay. I may get a raise in pay. <laughs> oh, I tell you, I bet the worship teams are going to be after me now to be their lead singer. Don't you imagine? You know, everybody in the world just wants to be happy. I mean, really, when it comes right down to it, whether you're trying to buy happiness or promote yourself into happiness, marry your way into happiness, really, we all just really want to be happy. I mean, wouldn't you say that that's the bottom line of what you want in your life? But the mistake that we make is how we think we're going to get there. You know. You know what a mirage is? It's like when you're out on the desert and you're so thirsty and the sun is shining a certain way and reflecting off the desert and it actually looks like there's a pool of water out there. And I'm sure you've seen these desert movies where people that are just about to die of thirst, they'll go and dive into what they think is a pool of water and be sloshing around in the sand and what a disappointment. Well, you know, I chased after mirages a lot of years of my life. Well, if I could just have more money, I'd be happy. And then that didn't do it. If, if, if I just, back years ago when I worked, I had an office job, if I just didn't have to work, I'd be happy. And then Dave said, well, then why don't you quit your job? So then I was like, well, if I could just get out of this house once in a while, then I'd be happy. 
Come on. If the devil would just leave me alone, I'd be happy. If Dave would change, I'd be happy. If my ministry would grow when I finally got into ministry, then I'd be happy. And I can tell you honestly, and I believe this with all my heart, your problem is really not your problem. Well, I guess we're going to have to stick on that one for a minute, aren't we? Because <laughs> I tried to give you a spoonful of vegetables and you wouldn't swallow it. <laughs> your problem is really not your problem. I mean, I'm telling you the truth. Your problem is not your problem. It's your attitude toward your problem that's your problem. You need to put things in perspective. You know, we let things get out of perspective and we tend to think that we, we focus on this thing in our life that we don't like and, and we just focus on that and focus on that till it becomes so much bigger than what it has to be. Let me read you a little story that makes a point about having a proper perspective. Dear mom and dad, since I left for college, I know I've been remiss in writing and I'm sorry for my thoughtlessness that I have not written you before now. So I'm going to bring you up to date in this letter. But before you read it, please sit down. Are you sitting down? Please don't read this unless you're sitting down. Well, I'm getting along pretty well now. The skull fracture and concussion that I got when I jumped out of my dormitory window when it caught on fire shortly after my arrival here has pretty well healed. I only get those sick headaches now once a day. Fortunately, the fire in my dorm and the jump was witnessed by an attendant at the gas station. He ran over, took me to the hospital, continued to visit me there. When I got out of the hospital, I had nowhere to live because of the burnout condition of my room. So he was kind enough to invite me to share his basement bedroom apartment with him. It's sort of small, but really cute. He is a very fine boy and we've even fallen deeply in love and are planning to get married. We haven't set the exact date yet, but it will be before my pregnancy begins to show. Yes, mom and dad, I'm pregnant. I know how much you're looking forward to being grandparents and I know you will welcome the baby and give it the same tender care and devotion that you gave me when I was a child. The reason for the delay in our marriage is that our boyfriend has a minor infection that I carelessly caught from him. I know, however, that you will welcome him into our family with open arms. After all, he is kind and although not well educated, he is ambitious. Although he is of a different race and a religion than ours, I know that your often expressed tolerance will not permit you to be bothered by that. In conclusion, mom and dad, now that I have brought you up to date, I want to tell you there was no dormitory fire. I do not have a concussion or a skull fracture. I was not in the hospital. I'm not pregnant. I'm not infected. And there's no boyfriend in my life. However, I am failing history and science. And I wanted you to have a proper perspective. Can you imagine how happy those parents were? Oh, thank God it's only that they're failing in school. Oh, thank God. And if she would have called and just said, I'm failing history and science, they would have probably had a fit and gotten all upset and mad and yelled and screamed at her and everybody would have been mad and crying. Maybe you need to take a little time today to look at your problem in the proper perspective of what's going on around the world and what kind of things people are dealing with. I'm going to say it again. Your problem is really not your problem. <laughs> it's your attitude toward your problem that's your problem. And see, the great thing about an attitude is it's your attitude and you can change it. You don't have to wait for it to change. You can actually just change your attitude. Viktor Frankl, while in a concentration camp in Germany, said the last of human freedoms and the one that nobody can take away is to choose one's attitude in any given set of circumstances. Even in a concentration camp, he decided, I have got something that you cannot take away from me. 
You can take away my food. You can take away my clothing. You can take away my bed. You can isolate me. You can force me to work at hard labor. But I have something you cannot take away from me. I have a good attitude, and you're not going to get it. See, I told you we're all getting an attitude adjustment today. Everybody just wants to be happy. And interestingly enough, the Bible repeatedly tells us, and I don't like it any better than you do, but it repeatedly tells us when we have trials and tribulations to be happy. Jesus said in John 16, 33, in the world you will have tribulation. It's a promise. And then the next thing he said is cheer up. Thank you. Cheer up. Why? Because even though you have problems, you also have me. In the world, you will have tribulation. Everybody in the world has tribulation. But you can cheer up because Jesus said, I have overcome the world. We need to stop being so bothered by our problems and just rejoice that we have God in our lives. Somebody said to me the other day, well, and it's it, a pretty good sized problem. Well, I guess we're just gonna have to trust God. And that just kind of hit me the wrong way. And I thought, you know what? I'm tired of saying that. I'm tired of hearing people say that. We don't just have to trust God. We get to trust God. It's a privilege to be able to trust God. What an honor it is to have a God that is faithful, that we know loves us, who has all power and all wisdom and all knowledge, who's everywhere all the time, never takes his eye off of us for one moment. We have problems, but we have God. The heathens, the unbelievers have problems and more problems and problems and problems and more problems and no hope and no resolution. And they'll spend their whole life chasing mirages and then having the disappointment of finding out, well, that's not really what I thought it was going to be after all. James 1, I can't resist having us look at this. So you have to be convinced that even though you have a problem, you can still be happy. Because if you're not convinced, you never will be. Well, Joyce, but I just feel, eh. That's the problem right there. <laughs> but I just feel, and I just think. I don't want to talk today about how you feel and what you think. I want to talk about what you know. Who do you know? What does the Word say? Let's live a little deeper. We need deeper relationships with God. We need to go beyond what we want, think, and feel to what we know in the depths of our heart. I know that God is faithful. I've seen Him be faithful too many times, over and over and over and over. Verse 2, James 1, 2. Consider it wholly joyful, my brethren, when you are enveloped in or encounter trials of any sort and fall into various temptations. Be holy, completely, totally joyful when you have all kinds of trouble. Hmm. You notice the clapping stopped. <laughs> Be assured and understand that the trial and the proving of your faith bring out endurance and steadfastness and patience. Well, I found out that they brought a lot of things out of me before we got around to patience and endurance. And... <laughs> but see, that's why they're good for us. Those hard times in our life are when we get experience and we, when we get equipment for the things that God wants to use us for in the future. When you're going through a hard time, you can say, God, I don't like this. It doesn't feel good. But I'm going to rejoice anyway because I know that I'm going to gain something out of this. I'm going to get something out of this. I'm going to be more mature. I'm going to know you better when this is over than I did when it started. Well, let's always remember that it's our attitude toward our problems that's our real problem. As followers of Jesus Christ, we can rejoice 
that we have the problem solver living on the inside of us. But I know that I know that I know that the Word of God is true and that He changes lives and He gives you a life worth living. Misschien ken je Joyce Meyer van haar boeken of van haar programma Enjoying Everyday Life. Maar wist je dat Joyce Meyer Ministries ook overal ter wereld concrete humanitaire hulp biedt? Door middel van voedselverstrekking, ziekenhuizen, noodhulp bij rampen, het bevrijden van slachtoffers van mensenhandel en nog veel meer. Deze christelijke hulporganisatie heet Hand of Hope en draait volledig op giften. Early on, mom and dad, you know, really just started to realize just how full the Bible is with uh, mandates that we're supposed to take care of the poor. You know, it talks all the time about visiting those that are in prison and feeding the hungry and you know taking in the stranger and, and taking care of the widow and the orphan. And so we strive to do that. And as the ministry has grown, our, our ability to influence and do bigger things has also grown. You know, as we travel around the world, we meet so many wonderful children that have had such desperate need in their life. And we're so grateful to be able to help them. Today, we happen to be in Thailand. And this little boy's name is Somded. And he's had some tragic things in his life, but thank God, through your help, he's now living in the children's home here, and his life is looking very bright. His parents both died when he was six in an auto accident. And when they found him to bring him here to the home, he had had severe ear infections, which had caused hearing loss and lots of other problems in his ears. So he's had about two years of medical treatment on his ears, and thank God he can hear fine now. And so thank you for helping us provide homes for some dead and for other little boys and girls like him all around the world. Over Jezus vertellen en mensen laten zien dat God van ze houdt. Ja, de vele noden op de wereld gaan de mens te boven. En misschien vraag je jezelf af of je er überhaupt wel iets aan kunt doen. Maar dat kan dus wel degelijk. Hand of Hope, de christelijke hulporganisatie van Joyce Meyer Ministries, is daar het bewijs van. Alles in één keer oplossen gaat niet. Maar wij bieden mensen één voor één de helpende hand.